Good afternoon and good morning, everyone online. Uh, welcome to this joint session jointly developed by a World Economic Forum and Yitai Media Group. Uh, my name is Yan Qing Yang. It is my great pleasure to moderate this session, Harnessing the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Comparable with the steam engine, electricity, internet, and the uh, other uh, great kind of the technologies, artificial intelligence, and also the fourth industrial revolution technology is regarded to uh, support the economic growth and also transform the uh, uh, the global economy uh, fundamentally down the road. Uh, in a very recent survey, 60% uh, of the CEO across the globe said that they believe that artificial intelligence will have a larger impact than the internet. So uh, this leadership panel today, we will examine how industries and the governments can work in partnership across the globe to unlock the potential of the artificial intelligence and also the full industrial revolution for the benefit and the global common good in 2021 uh, and also the beyond. Uh, we have uh, a great panel today, a great combination between the uh, government leaders and also the business leaders. Uh, we have uh, Ken Hu, Deputy Chairman, Huawei Technology, People's Republic of China. He's also the member of the uh, IBC in the World Economic Forum. We have Andreas Kuzi. Uh, he is the Chief uh, Executive Officer and also co-founder of a uh, 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 startup and a very new technology-driven company, uh, Conex Inc. And also uh, we have uh, Mohit Jiangxi. Uh, from, he is a uh, president of the Infosi from, from India. And the last but not least, we have a uh, uh, Mr. Xiao Ya Qing. Uh, he is the minister, minister, minister of the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology from uh, uh, People's Republic of China. We are very uh, uh, unfortunate that the, uh, we have a minister from Rwanda at the last minute to uh, to uh, draw from the uh, session, and we hope that we can have her uh, last time. So uh, we're going to have an interactive uh, uh, discussion in the first round, then followed with a Q&A from our uh, online audience. So we're going to have a uh, 45 minutes today. Okay, let's start by our interaction phase. First of all, we've talked about the AI, the fourth industrial technology, uh, as well as the difference between the fourth industrial technology, industry revolution, and internet. So my first question is for Mr. Xiao. In order to start our discussion, we know that AI and the fourth industrial revolution, this can be have, a, we can use a, a top-down approach or bottom-up approach as well. So the government is playing a very important role in it. So. My question is, what is Chinese government do to in harnessing this force into the revolution? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Actually, actually we know that the fourth industrial revolution is a very important topic, topic for recent years, an important topic for Davos Economic Forum. We know that the technologies of fourth industrial revolution is pushing ahead, uh, covering several disciplines and sectors. We know that uh, a lot of technology innovations and commercial innovations are stemming from this fourth industrial revolution, and uh, we are gl glad to share a lot of experience with us. I guess the background of economic recession today I believe that it is important to seize on the opportunities of this fourth industrial revolution. That's the reason why I am very interested in the topic of today. We actually attach a great importance to this fourth industrial revolution, and we hope that this technology will boost the upgrade of the traditional industry as well as smart revolution. We know that President Xi Jinping at numerous occasions mentioned that we have to follow the trend of this fourth industrial revolution, we have to seize on the tendency of informatization, digitalization, etc. We have to explore new model, new industry, and to discover new uh, driving force for the growth and new pathways for growth. So I think uh, today it is of more, more important to remember uh, is speech. So at our ministry, we have carried out a work in three respects. First of all, we 
have combined a new innovation system with intellectuals, researchers, and industries. We are trying to transform the industry, uh, the technology into a reality. We are building a more conducive and transparent innovation environment. Secondly, we are trying to boost the new technology sectors. We're doing breakthroughs in the new technologies. We are enhancing, for example, biology, new material, as well as the new energy cars, etc. Thirdly, we are doing work to integrate new technologies and manufacturing sectors. And we are leveraging the benefits of the digital infrastructure and to develop the manufacturing uh, based on service. And we are also promoting 5G, industrial uh, internet, and big data, et cetera, and as well as their integrations with other sectors. We're also boosting upgrading of traditional sectors so that they can be more smart, more technological oriented. Moving forward, we're going to reinforce our cooperation and open up, and we're going to optimize our conducive environment for innovation. We, are, we also have to work on the safety aspects and also try to avoid all the risks brought about by the new technologies in order to play our bigger role in this fourth industrial revolution. Thank you. Uh, you talked about innovation in industries and how the digital technology can enable every industry. And also he talked about the right balance between the risk and also the benefits and also uh, uh, pay a lot of attention on the uh, global collaboration. We will discuss further in a minute. Uh, now uh, we uh, have our uh, three uh, global industry leaders from the uh, uh, different region, or from China, from India, and also uh, from Europe. So uh, I would like to uh, 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 I think that uh, uh, Mr. Mohit Joshi, will you share us and uh, tell us the story from India and why artificial intelligence is different and how can we uh, mitigate the risk and how to support <coughs> economic growth in India and also in Asia, please. Sure, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. So uh, Infosys is a company that's headquartered in Bangalore in India, but really we work with large enterprises across the world. So it's pretty much of a global operation. From my perspective, when I think of AI, and we especially think of the impact of AI within the corporate community, right? Within large companies. Uh, the way we see it, it has four different levels, right? So the first level is, that business models themselves are changing. We're seeing a, a huge amount of transformation of enterprises themselves. And the way you see this is you see data monetization happening within companies. You see as a service models evolving. You see companies becoming almost completely digital. And you're seeing a blurring of boundaries between companies. So I think one of the impacts of AI is the fact that business models themselves which are changing quite dramatically. The second thing that we see is that, uh, you know, there is a convergence of technologies. Cloud is obviously essential from an AI perspective. Uh, then you've got IoT, you've got robotics. So you're seeing multiple technologies come together and AI is just a label that we're applying things that we're seeing across the board. So you're seeing a change in industry models you're seeing a uh, convergence of various technologies. You're seeing questions of ethics being raised uh, in terms of data privacy, in terms of uh, data security, in terms of questions about bias. And then finally, you're seeing AI being applied in the context of, uh, you know, in the context of changing workforce dynamics. Uh, the workforce is a lot more distributed now. Uh, you have challenges of aging populations across the world. And you also have the need to have really unmanned uh, operations in many businesses, right? So we've seen the drive, uh, the rise of autonomous driving, for instance. So when you look at all these four things, right? When you look at the fact that industry models are changing, when you look at the fact that uh, technologies are uh, converging, you look at the questions of ethics and you look at the question of uh, changing workforce dynamics. I think this really means uh, that uh, for enterprises, AI is really going to transform businesses. In the first phase, I think what we've seen is a 
significant adoption from a consumer perspective of AI. And you know, you've seen this from a social media perspective. You've started to see this from a manufacturing perspective and from a retail uh, perspective. But in the second phase, we feel that enterprises are going to be adopting AI in a very significant way and changing their dynamics, uh, you know, both from a cost perspective and from a customer perspective quite dramatically. Let me take banking as an example, for instance. Uh, within banking, uh, we are seeing the impact of AI first on customer interactions. So the use of chatbots, for instance, of virtual agents to interact with customers. Uh, secondly, we're seeing the impact of AI on the creation of products. So you can create products almost immediately, create products that are hyper-personalized and tailored to individual customers, which you could not do in the past. And finally, we're seeing the impact of AI from a, you know, from a data warehousing, data gathering, model building perspective. And this has an impact on anti-money laundering, for instance, of KYC. So if I should take banking as an example of an industry impacted by AI, you're seeing a change in customer interactions, seeing a change uh, you know, in the way uh, data is used and uh, uh, consumed within the enterprise. And you're also seeing an impact in the sort of products uh, the financial industry makes. So uh, again, it's a very, very broad-based change and we are going to see entire industries being transformed, uh, which is why we think applied AI for enterprises is the next big opportunity. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Josh. You almost touched on uh, every aspect of the artificial intelligence. Now we turn to uh, Mr. Ken Hu. Uh, what is Huawei's view? Do you agree that the uh, artificial intelligence is a bigger impact and bigger uh, new force uh, compared with the uh, uh, internet, please. Uh, Mr. Ken, Hu, Hu Zong. Sorry, we cannot hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes, please. Okay, yeah, so, so thank you very much for the question. And uh, it's a great honor to be here for this, uh, for this uh, discussion. And uh, I'm pleased to, to, to learn from uh, Minister Xiao and uh, Mohit for their views on, um, on the uh, fourth industrial revolution. And uh, actually, I share the views from Minister Xiao that the fourth industrial revolution is actually a combination of innovation on business and technology. And Huawei, as a global tech, uh, digital technology provider, uh, we have done a lot of job with our customers, different countries, different organizations on promoting the usage of uh, AI, Internet of Things, 5G, uh, and the big tech. So I would say that all those technologies are fundamental uh, elements of the digital society, and uh, they're all essential for the fourth industrial revolution. We have seen so many uh, uh, successful reference uh, in different scenarios. So, so he, here I'd like to share some, some of my uh, experience uh, in different industries. Uh, for example, in China, during the pandemic, we started, uh, at, at, at the day one, we started to work with different hospitals in China to develop some uh, platform with the AI technology. And now uh, this uh, AI supported platform has been uh, uh, deployed, uh, deployed in cross China and also in some other countries in the world. So now, you know, with the AI support, now the doctors can build the CT scan in a much faster way. Before, a experienced doctor spend around 12 minutes to reveal a single CT scan, but now it takes just two minutes. So you can see that from 12 minutes to two minutes, this is a big saving on time, but for me, it is not just the saving on time, it's the saving of life. Because during the pandemic, AI will help us to, uh, will, uh, will help the doctors to spend more time on the patients. And another example uh, is in the mining industry. Last year, I paid a visit to a open site of a mining company in the Mongolia, in China, uh, you know, there they transform because in the, in the mining side, uh, yeah, we always see, uh, see a lot of trucks, very, very big trucks for the, the mining store. And the, now in, the, in this company, they transform the traditional mining truck uh, into the autonomous driving car. 
uh, autonomous driving truck. So uh, before they have they they had to hire lots of drivers. So normally they have to hire four drivers for each truck with very high salary, which is much higher than the market average. And even in that case, it, 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 it's hard for them to, 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 to hire the driver they need. And now with the uh, autonomous driving truck, uh, they don't need to hire so many drivers as before. And particularly uh, from the efficiency perspective, they can enhance the speed of the truck from 10 kilometers per hour to 35 kilometers per hour. So that's a big increase uh, in terms of the efficiency. So in addition to the business benefit, uh, this case brings to the, to the company, you also create big social value because the condition of safety of the workforce in those mining companies has been greatly uh, uh, improved. So, so we can see that, you know, lots of uh, very good reference in different uh, industries that we can see more and more uh, business interest and uh, social impact, uh, you know, positive social impact uh, generated by the uh, AI and also other technologies. So I would say that uh, there's a lot of room for us to work together moving forward to generate more benefits from all those emerging technologies. H however, uh, as all the revolutions, we also need to pay attention to the other side. Um, yeah, we'll have lots of benefits. However, uh, we also need to figure out what would be the hurdle, what would be the, what would be the risk, what would be the challenges. Uh, from my perspective, obviously, um, there, will always, there will always be some challenges in terms of technology, in terms of business model. And for, uh, for, uh, for business opportunities, um, to be honest, those challenges are quite exciting because they uh, will bring us lots of opportunity for innovation. However, from the society perspective, I would say we need to pay more attention to the people. We need to figure out what would be the impact of those innovations to the, to the people, of course. Post industrial revolution, all this emerging technology will, great, will, will bring us great, up, uh, great benefits, but there will also be some disruption in many industries. As a result, many jobs and lives will be affected. And uh, I think for us, the right strategy is to make sure that all the stakeholders, government, industry, people work together to think about how to expand yeah. opportunities during this uh, revolution and to think about how to help every people get ready for the future. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Hu Zhong, very much. Uh, wonderful examples from the uh, uh, medical area and also from the mining industry uh, for telling us how the pandemic uh, igniting the uh, uh, speeding up of the uh, artificial intelligence and this kind of new technology to support the people and save the lives. A wonderful, wonderful examples. And also uh, you touch upon the uh, uh, the people are very uh, center of the uh, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. We will discuss that a little later. Now uh, we will turn to uh, Mr. Andreas Ponzi tell us some story from the Connex. Uh, Connex is a, uh, is a real fourth industrial revolution a uh, company combining IoT and artificial intelligence. Tell us your story, please. Thank you very much. And I, I cannot uh, say anything else than I agree to uh, what Ken Moritz and the Honorable Minister said before. I think the human should be in the center of, uh, of everything. And um, when we apply AI and also at Conox, the human has and the impact perspective has to be in the center. So what do I mean by that? There were great examples already from the mining industry, but um, also from other industries um, where AI helps making jobs easier and also save human lives. Um, we at Conox, our vision is to transform railway operations for a more sustainable future. And we say for us, the human and sustainability is in the center of everything we do and we apply AI to make the jobs of workers easier. And um, because as an example, 
when you look at all the rail tracks and railway is the most sustainable mode of motorized transportation because it just takes seven percent of emission compared to a short distance plane and if you look at how does the system operate there are a lot of humans involved going out in the field every day and night and repairing inspecting tracks and this is a very risky job so especially the inspection part of things so it's in the top it's one of the most top 10 um, dangerous jobs in the world and we are helping them and railway companies to create a safer environment by applying uh, IoT sensors into the field, gathering the relevant data of the infrastructure, and then applying AI to tell when somebody has to go out and maintain what, with which tools and how effective this maintenance was. Um, thereby, we are helping really to reduce the number of actions that have to be in the field. Because you can imagine looking at a big rail network like um, like we have in Europe and in China, there are huge distances where people have to travel to go out just to gather the status quo through visual or manual inspections. And this is quite dangerous if rail, if trains are passing by with 300 kilometers an hour, right? You can imagine that that force applied that, that environment where, um, and we are actually enabling them to just go out when they have to and with a concrete action. And so, and I think taking that one step back, it's really about, as also the other speakers already told, it's really differentiating when applying AI between, first of all, um, two things, right? What kind of data do I use? Do I use machine data or do I use personal data? For both different types of data, your different rules should apply because the one is really, when we say putting the human into the center of everything, we should save the human and also their privacy. But on the other side, when we look at machine data, we should really focus and leverage on what we have already and creating imp applied, uh, applied AI that creates impact for the humans and sustainability. And also this is really what we as colleagues are committed to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andreas, for expanding our boundary from the human data to the machine data and how can we combine uh, the different sets of data together and also put a people, human in the center. At the same time, we can uh, uh, say they uh, are very dangerous, uh, these kind of jobs, transform these kind of jobs from the uh, human to the machine. I think it's a very big uh, revolutionary step. We will uh, come back to that a little, a little later. Now, I think that we have some time for the second round of this discussion. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, talk a little bit on the uh, international uh, collaboration, also the uh, uh, this uh, uh, job, the, the jobs of the uh, the different governments, and also uh, the uh, harnessing uh, the issue and also the governance issue. Uh, 我想呢，我们还有一点点时间呢，可以进行第二轮的讨论。我想呢，再请。Now, second round of questions. I'd like to ask Minister Xiao. International cooperation is very important to further harness fourth industrial revolution. There will also be different standards. How do you look at international cooperation? And Minister Xiao, could you hear me? In terms of international cooperation. I can hear you. Thank you for your question. So, what's your take for international cooperation? I think it's indeed very important in terms of AI development. International cooperation is very important. Now, there, there is no border for AI technologies. You cannot look at it in a very tra in a traditional way. So, for us, in terms of international cooperation of AI development, we have to work together. 
And this international cooperation can be within and uh, between companies and between different stakeholders, between different regions, between different countries, of course. Of course, we have to uh, strengthen exchanges and mutual understanding. If we can do this, we can better cooperate. Without this cooperation, it's very difficult to develop AI. We can have a me dialogue mechanism because the fourth uh, industrial revolution speaks to a very different kind set of uh, policies. So coordination and cooperation are very important. Secondly, we have to cooperate in terms of new technologies because this is where uh, I, AI will develop. So each country, each stakeholder has its advantages, which can be pulled together through a, a cooperation mechanism. Then we also have to do demonstration projects. Mr. Hu from Huawei and um, the representative of Connex gave a lot of examples. So projects, cooperation, especially pilot and demonstration projects, which can be used to further train talents and explore different patterns of cooperation and coordination. There are huge prospects here for China. From the perspective of the government, of course, we welcome this kind of cooperation. You are all welcome. Thank you. For uh, emphasize again on the uh, uh, different governments and also the different role for us to collaborate uh, uh, very seamlessly to uh, harnessing and also the unleashing the power and the potential of the artificial intelligence and also the fourth industrial revolution. And now uh, we have a, uh, I received a, a bunch of the uh, questions from our audience online and they are, uh, uh, they are uh, focusing uh, a lot of attention on the uh, governance issue and especially on the data issue. Uh, they are talking about the, uh, the trust and the safety and the transparency uh, of the data. So, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mohi from Joshi from the uh, uh, Infosi. Infosi is uh, also a global company. So, I think that uh, Mr. Uh, Joshi will have uh, a lot of uh, insights on the uh, governance issue, especially on the data issue. Uh, Joshi, please. Sure. So, I think as far as AI is concerned, there are a lot of questions from an ethics perspective. And I think they go down to three or four issues, right? One is the issue of bias. Because we're making decisions based on existing data sets. We have to make sure that these data sets don't in themselves codify a level of bias. So for instance, if my existing lending operation is uh, biased against uh, you know, a certain race of people or against a certain demographic of people, then the machine learning algorithm is gonna end up making the same mistakes. So I think bias is one key issue to look at when you're creating these algorithms. Uh, the second is the issue of, uh, of explainability, right? Uh, how am I able to explain the decisions that I've made using an AI algorithm? Uh, because at the end of the day, the decision has been made using massive sets of data and the same sort of explainability that a human actor has may not be possible. But this is one key thing that we have to keep in consideration while building these, uh, you know, these algorithms. Uh, there is the question of control. Uh, how can we be sure that we have control over the uh, algorithms that, uh, that we've created? And so while creating an AI strategy for our uh, clients, uh, these are issues that we ask them to focus on, you know, the issue of bias, uh, the issue of explainability, the issue of control. And uh, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that as far as possible, uh, people have control over their own data, that they're able to, you know, uh, they're able to have a degree of control over their data such that if it's being used in algorithms, at least it is being driven by a level of informed consent. Uh, I feel that this is a very important issue because it goes to the level of trust in AI. And obviously as a, you know, as a community, we wanna make sure that there is a very high level of trust in what the algorithms are delivering. And having uh, you know, a strategy on this, being able to lay out 
a charter or a set of guidelines is very important for companies as they embark on their AI initiatives. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mohi Joshi. And you talk about the uh, bias of the data and also control of the data. And also we need some uh, a global uh, common charter to uh, push forward for the uh, utilization of the artificial intelligence. So I would like to turn to uh, uh, Mr. Ken Hu and also uh, Andreas Kuzi. And you are a real uh, uh, industry practitioner using the technology, using the artificial intelligence. When we talk about the uh, uh, data privacy, maybe we can use some new technologies like uh, federal rated uh, kind of machine learning, we can solve the problem. But as to the uh, the bias and also to the uh, the control and the safety of the artificial intelligence, maybe uh, it will be a little difficult, a little more difficult. So what is your view on the, uh, uh, the broad or the specific uh, issue of the governance of the data and the governance of the artificial intelligence? Ken, please, and then Andreas. Okay, thank you. The, this is a very uh, important question uh, in the process of the fourth industrial revolution because I believe that data is a key asset in this revolution. And uh, yeah, we have to uh, maxi uh, maximize the value of the data. And uh, in order to do that, we have to make sure that um, more data to be shared and more value to be generated. However, in order to make people comfortable to share that data fundamentally, we have to make sure that all the data are well protected. And uh, to this end, I believe that uh, the cooperation uh, is highly needed. The cooperation between uh, pri public and private sectors, the uh, cooperation across uh, different industries. Um, from my perspective, I think uh, government can help us to make a clear uh, legal framework and uh, uh, provide a clear guidance for uh, different business community, community on data ownership and, uh, and sharing. And uh, in some of the cases, government can even uh, help to build platforms for sharing data in special scenarios. For example, during the pandemic, uh, uh, many countries in, in many countries, government built the uh, public shared platform to share the data for pandemic response, which is greatly helping uh, the, uh, our human society dealing with this, uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, at the same time, the business community, the companies should uh, do their own job as well. Uh, at Huawei, we have a big emphasis on the data pro protection uh, because as I just mentioned, uh, the better you protect the data, uh, bigger the bigger uh, benefit you get. Uh, you you you'll be able to generate uh, from the data. So uh, as a company, uh, there are a lot of things we can do as well. Uh, firstly, as a technology company, uh, we should try our best on innovation to adopt uh, new technologies like the reliable and trusted computing technologies to make sure that all the data are uh, um, reliable and the security, and particularly to make sure that uh, none of the data will be compromised during the process of data sharing. And secondly, uh, uh, for any uh, organizations, um, I would say that we, ha we have to make sure that we fully comply with the uh, data protection regulation in all the countries where we operate our business. For example, in Europe, uh, uh, the EU has already uh, announced the GDPR, which is a pretty uh, useful uh, practice. Uh, so we as a, a foreign company operating there, so, so we have to make sure that yeah, all of our business operations will fully comply with, with, with those re uh, regulatory requirements. And certainly, uh, as a business community, we are in the field. We are working in lots of real cases. So that will give us a chance to provide some probably very helpful uh, input to the regulators to help them uh, for, a, for a better legislation or better uh, regulation. Thank you, uh, Ken. Uh, a very good elaboration on the uh, collaboration between the governments and industries and also 
uh, how we can uh, really make sure that the data is uh, uh, seriously uh, protected by the uh, by the regulation. Uh, then the GDPR is a very good example. Uh, now uh, I would like to turn to NGS to talk a little bit on the maybe experiences and also the uh, uh, people thinking in the Europe. In terms of the data uh, uh, governance and in terms of the uh, technology governance, uh, Europe is a uh, is have a pioneering role across the globe. And some people will say that maybe the Europe's uh, regulation is the uh, most strict. How could we make sure that the Europe's role will be shared and also Europe's spirit on the governance of the uh, technology will be shared by uh, Asia, by uh, United States? And how can we make sure that the uh, global uh, elaboration and global collaboration on the, uh, uh, this regulation will be, will be successful? Please. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is a great question. Um, I think GDPR um, is really focusing on protecting private data um, of people. So also the human is again in the center of this regulation, which protects the people. So if you look at, um, but if you look at this distinguishment between machine and um, personal data, Really, this GDPR is all about this personal data part. And I think there it is there to protect the people's privacy, which is a great example and which people in Europe would value um, quite a lot. If you look at the machine data perspective, I think there, um, because you mentioned that before, and also Ken mentioned that before, that how can we ensure that we share data and collaborate across country lines? like trains are traveling across country lines. Um, how can we ensure that the AI actually proves its value? So that, that means that we really ensure that the benefit and the exponent, so that the, the, on the one hand, the explainability is there. This should be done by testing. So AI has to prove itself against whatever has been there before. And I think this is a very uh, important part. And I think, the more we talk about it, the more clear it will get how we do this testing and how we will do the certifications in the different um, sectors and segments. But I think we all know that more data will enhance algorithms and more had mentioned that before. And I think that means to let AI prove itself against whatever has been there in terms of processes before in a certain application, the collaboration across country lines and with governments and with um, about machine data has to improve and has to um, get much more fluent because that will enhance algorithms, that will enhance the benefits of the um, algorithms in the different applications where the human is in the, in the end the benefitee of everything, uh, of those, uh, so for those applications. So my view is that I think GDPR is a great example for the protection of private data. If you look at machine data, I think we have to treat that differently. And I think collaboration across country lines should be easier because we all just benefiting from it. And I think this is also where governments can help themselves and each other to really foster that understanding. And then we, we can develop certain rules and standards, which are just for the benefit of every, every human, because we're, as we said before, think AI should really focus on those impact areas. And as the, uh, every speaker here said, where human man, my, mankind has actually a benefit from. Yeah. Thank you, Andrews, very much. Uh, we uh, have uh, a lot of the questions coming in, but we uh, are running uh, out of the time. So uh, very quickly, I would uh, like uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mohi, uh, Joshi will uh, respond a little bit for the follow-up question from the audience. Uh, they are interested in that, how can we make sure the algorithm uh, of the uh, machine learning can really uh, solve the problem of the bias? Can we solve that problem? Very quickly, please. So I think, look, uh, you know, you can never be sure that the issue of bias has been solved because you may get rid of one kind of bias. You may get rid of a bias that comes from, let's say to my earlier example of lending by race, but you may still have the issue of lending by sex. 
I think the issue is that if you have a very clear charter from an ethics perspective of what you're looking to do by using AI technologies, that charter is readily accessible to the entire organization and that it really serves as a guide map for what you're looking to accomplish and you know issues of bias, issues of privacy, issues of control, issues of explainability are addressed, then I think uh, you will have a good outcome. We work with several companies across the world. We think applied AI is a huge opportunity for enterprises, but having this charter of AI ethics upfront is a useful first step to really commercialize AI for the entire enterprise. Thank you. And also, uh, our audience are asking uh, Ken, uh, Mr. Ken Hu, about maybe uh, the artificial intelligence are uh, replacing the machine, are uh, taking all of jobs and replacing the human jobs and workers. So are you concerned about the unemployment issue here? Ken, please. Uh, yes, I think that's, that's kind of the hurdle I just mentioned. Um, yeah, adding revolution will generate some disruption in the, in the, in the different industries. And uh, uh, of course, as a result of the deployment of the AI, many jobs will be automated. And uh, so that would be some challenge for us. However, I always believe that a challenge is, a, is also an opportunity. So uh, what we should do is to figure out how to expand the opportunities for our existing workforces on um, yeah. how to, yeah, we will have the chance with the new technology, we will have the chance to create more opportunities instead of just uh, um, trying to uh, maintain um, the existing jobs. Yeah, at, at Huawei, we have a very uh, maybe, maybe, interesting example. Maybe we can, yeah, maybe we can create yeah. more jobs, yeah. But that's that's maybe no, yeah. an angle for the yeah, solution. Yeah, just one job. Yeah, just one job. Uh, at Huawei, many years ago, we started to uh, introduce the AI technology into our R and D jobs. And uh, while more and more jobs uh, in R and D and production line are automated, of course, uh, we uh, we didn't need uh, as many as the uh, you know uh, regular workforce as we pulled. However, at the same time, we hired more and more uh, engineers for creative jobs. And uh, 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 yeah, as a result, in the past 10 years of uh, our, our workforce uh, extended yeah. year by year. Yeah, yeah we should always thank you, Mr. Hu. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. We have run out of time. Our time is already used up. But finally, I would like to ask Mr. Xia to conclude. Thank you. 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 Open cooperation in terms of AI between governments, between governments and companies. How do, does Chinese government look at this cooperation? Okay, okay. Thank you. We all care about cooperation, but we also have to follow rules of innovation and development. We have such a consensus. At the same time, rules can help us to further develop. We have to have a good set of rules so that we can drive further development of AI. And we need you all to cooperate. Also, the consensus from the all the practitioner and also stakeholder from all across of the roads and also from all across the globe. Thank you very much. I think our uh, we have had a very uh, lively, a very interactive, very good discussion today. Thank you very much. See you next time.